What does it mean to be human? This is a question which countless philosophers, writers, and even artists have attempted to grapple with throughout history, with all of them trying to capture that very essence of life itself into an easily understandable package. And within the setting of Project Moon's games, it is flush with many examples of characters trying to solve that very question, one of the most major of them being an entire wing, this being the 14th wing of the city, Nagla Un Hammer, also known as Encore, as their answer to the question lies in the value of the experience of life more so than one's life itself, and thus they created a culture within the portion of the city that gave birth to the megalomaniacal mallet manipulating machine mangler who masterfully managed mortifying maneuvers to assure their matriarchal monarchy, Cromer, the one who grips. Cromer is the primary antagonistic force of the story for Limbus Company's third canto, The Unconfronting. Being the leader of Encorp's own Inquisition, Cromer led a cult of fiercely loyal followers in the appreciation of the human form, as well as the violent elimination of all those who embrace the heresy of perverting that human form, such as those with mechanical enhancements or prosthetics. Though it is arguable if Cromer would have been able to achieve the amount of success that she did if not for her befriending of the 11th sinner of Limbus Company, Emile Sinclair. With their lives becoming completely intertwined during their school years together, and more specifically, when Sinclair allowed Cromer access to his family's basement. But before we can get too deeply into that, let's first understand the meaning behind both her name and design. Now, Cromer's name, like most other names in Project Moon titles, is a direct literary reference, coming from the novel Damien, the story of Emile Sinclair's youth, by Hermann Karl Hess, with Cromer specifically being taken from the character of Franz Cromer, who I'll be referring to as Franz for a majority of the video to try to avoid any confusion. Now, Franz was an older delinquent boy who manages to catch Sinclair in a lie and basically takes control of his life, let alone his future, tormenting the boy throughout and and eventually leading to not only Sinclair's psychological breakdown, but eventually drawing him closer to another boy in his life named Max Damien. These are all, of course, elements that work in line with the story of Cromer and Canto 3 as a whole, but I will go into more detail about that later on in the video. As well, thanks to this influence, I am convinced that if we ever got Cromer's full name, it would be something along the lines of Francesca or Francine Cromer. Now, design-wise, Cromer takes a lot of influence from quite a few different places, most of which will be discussed later on into the video, but the one design we become the most familiar with is that of her N-Corp Inquisitor uniform, which combines together elements of a Crusading Knight's full plate armor in the form of her leggings and full arm combo piece, with the metal itself even marked with scriptures and wax stamps that display N-Corp's logo, as well as bloody ribbons, likely as a symbol of successful operations like you see on military uniforms. Along with this, the armored side is also adorned with a large flag carrying N-Corp's own insignia, while the unarmored portion of her uniform matches up very well with a mixture of 1600s casual wear and a military regalia, with the white color also matching up with the perceived purity that Cromer is working towards, while the yellowing effect that we see throughout the uniform shows that it's not only been used quite frequently, but it's also been stained with the blood and plasma of previous battles. Also, it gives it a general eggshell color, which will matter later on. Ultimately, this outfit's whole purpose is to invoke the energy of the Catholic Inquisition which is a pretty direct inspiration for Encorp's own Inquisition unit, which not only was it the mission of Encorp to spread their views across the city, similar to that of the Inquisition spread across the world, but their Inquisitor's strict adherence to doctrines, their heavy armored enforcers adorned with symbols of their faith, and the systematic torturing and destruction of their perceived heretics all really drive the nail home on their inspiration. As well, Cromer and her crew, due to their Germanic literary origins, likely pull inspiration from two of Germany's most most notable inquisitors, this being Conrad von Marburg and Heinrich Kramer, with Conrad being known as the first real inquisitor of Germany, and due to the freedom of his reign, he oftentimes found himself becoming excessively cruel in his punishments, torturing his victims and burning them alive at the stake, while Heinrich Kramer, also known for the quickness of his sentences, was driven by a hatred towards heretics and witchcrafts, but also became well known for his attempt to institutionalize his own power in the form of a treatment 
Patricius known as the Hammer of Witches, which went into detail on not only the heresy of witches, but on how women are to blame for inciting lust in others, and those found guilty of this witchcraft should be tortured and burned alive. This work not only failed to gain endorsement of the church, but was ultimately condemned by it, feeling that it was too personal in Kramer's own ideals, which had an unexpected result, as it had a surge of popularity within the common man outside of the church, and within the extremist subsects of the church, which relate to Cromer in a good number of ways, from the hammer symbology, to the connection to the sin of lust, and the fact that Cromer's own actions in her group are seen as extremist by Marceau, a person who comes from Encorp and knows how the factions operate. Even Kramer and Cromer come from the same Germanic origin name of Kramer. As well, the hammer and nail elements of Cromer and Encorp's design as a whole likely takes inspiration from one of Project Moon's own creations, this of course being the Silent Girl, a once unused abnormality in Lobotomy Corp turned major anomaly fight in Library of Ruina. They are depicted as an innocent girl holding a nail and hammer behind her back with the intent to use these tools on those with heavy guilt for their actions. As well, the concept art of the Silent Girl implies that she once had an association with a massive church-like stained glass window. As well, the dialogue found on the abnormality pages in Ruina describe her function, as while well, of course we have her punishing those rife with guilt, we also see her describing the nail shattering the minds of those she punishes in the similar fashion to driving a nail through a glass window. And it is this obsession with punishing the guilty and this fixation on hammers and nails that greatly represents itself in elements of both Cromer and Encorp's design. The window even connects to one of Encorp's own singularities. This being a device which allows those who peer into it the ability to see alternate realities. Similar in practice to Yisong's own glass mirror creation, the device is only hinted as the glass window, one which allowed Cromer to see the world in which Emile Sinclair ascended to the rank as the one who grips, and together she and him would cleanse the whole city of heretics. Though this discovery likely came after their meeting for the first time, as before she had ascended the ranks of the Inquisition, Cromer found herself influenced by the culture of District 14. Considering herself to be a humanitarian, she says that she loves all things human, and likely saw that Encorp not only highlighted humanity's beauty, but enforced said beauty with an iron fist. In fact, you could even say that Encorp force feeds their ideologies onto their populace in a quite literal way, as the food in which residents eat within District 14 contain elements of their main singularity. This is only ever explained as canned experiences, which allows someone to feel or experience something without needing to actually go through with the process. The type of experiences can differ, but one of the most popular items is a canned unaliving, which is an experience so sought after that people will travel or even migrate to Encorp just to experience them. As well, it is heavily suggested within Don Quixote, Marceau, and Heathcliff's own Encorp ID that the food in which people eat can numb their brains so that it is easier to implant the hammer and nails ideology into them, with those who eat and listen to the figure heads of the religion describing their minds as being cleared essentially. It is a form of brainwashing disguised as faith and those who consume the product become fiercely loyal to that said cause. As well, it seems to elevate one's own emotions, be it the distrust or disgust for anything that violates the human form. Cromer is definitely someone who has experienced this process, as she not only dislikes the impurity of prosthetics, but considers their usage to be inherently filthy, barely even being able to tolerate living amongst those who wear them. Now, it is up in the air if Cromer originates from District 11 or 14, with District 11 being more likely, as according to Rhodia's own Encorp ID, the Inquisition isn't opposed to recruiting members from other nests or backstreets for their cause, as once they subject them to to the canned experiences and fully indoctrinate them, their new agents can return to their homeland and enact the justice of Encorp on those outside domains. Cromer was likely just someone who had a similar disdain for prosthetics that Sinclair had, but just fell down the cult-like rabbit hole that greatly elevated her own sins. Either way, Cromer eventually earned the title of the one who grips at a relatively young age, which either implies that she came from a relatively wealthy family and was scouted by a board member 
for her ideals, or somehow managed to earn a meeting with a higher up at N-Corp before being fully indoctrinated. But this all seems to have happened before she met Sinclair, with my best guess being that she was somehow selected by N-Corp using their own glass mirror singularity to see her own potential. This idea is mostly based on the fact that the same singularity would go on to encourage Kromer's own actions in the future, though her skills were also based on her pride as a human, developing into quite a powerful inquisitor in her own right. Eventually, she was then selected by N-Corp to infiltrate the K-Corp nest, and more specifically, the town of Kauf, known as the holy site of Nest K's prosthetic industry. And it was here she was seemingly given two objectives. Firstly, she was to secure the location of L-Corp's K-2 branch, and then following that success, she was to enact the will of N-Corp on the town. Thus, to accomplish these goals, Cromer would then be placed into the school system of Calf, and it is here that she would eventually befriend Emile Sinclair. After catching wind of his family's status, when Sinclair reveals to his class that his father had deals in the works with P Corp, which of course resembles the aforementioned connection between Franz Cromer and Cromer. As to put it simply, within the novel, Sinclair is a boy who believed in the idea of two realms in society, that being the Light Realm, which was the home world, the life that provided safety and comfort, but was unfortunately boring and predictable, while the opposite was referred to as the Dark Realm, which was ultimately freeing, but was full of danger. Franz Kromer was someone who lived in that Dark Realm, while Sinclair himself was too cowardly to ever fully involve himself in it directly, and thus, when Sinclair decided to lie about stealing some expensive apples, this in turn caused Franz to immediately lunge on him, threatening to turn him in for it as he would receive two German marks by doing so, a currency of the time, which is an action that would have destroyed Sinclair's reputation no matter if he was found guilty of false theft or not, meaning that Franz could hold it as leverage over Sinclair to control the boy, and soon enough he'd become like a trained animal for Franz, being able to summon him by simply whistling from their usual spot. Franz's torment would even result in Sinclair falling deeper and deeper into his perceived Dark Realm, feeling like he was forced to steal his own allowance and having nightmares that Franz would demand him to do things that he didn't want to. One such included the stabbing of his own father to death. Sinclair essentially feared that he could never escape Franz's own influence, and every day he would question what Franz would do to make him hurt again, until he met with Damien, a boy from their school who had a strange aura about him and would eventually help cleanse Sinclair Sinclair of Franz's grasp, which are all elements of the story that are reimagined in Canto 3 in Sinclair's own past. Firstly, you have, of course, Cromer's Whistle, an element of her character so ingrained that even Faust's N-Corp ID, which is of course based on Cromer, has a passive that utilizes the whistle. As well, the way Cromer approaches Sinclair to ensure him that he isn't alone in his feelings about prosthetics and that she would help him be able to avoid having to go through with his own surgeries if he helped her by taking Cromer into his family's basement mirrors in a lot of ways how Franz speaks to Sinclair about their two mark debt, often using disarming language or trying to imply that he's just here to help Sinclair and that he isn't out to hurt him, while systematically manipulating the boy into doing what he wants. And then you have Sinclair stealing his own house key for Cromer, which resembles when Sinclair steals his own allowance from one of his parents' stored away piggy banks in order to try to pay back Franz, which unfortunately wasn't enough to equal up to the two marks resulting in Franz simply giving Sinclair his money back and continuing to torment him, which in turn causes Book Sinclair to feel as if he has been permanently thrusted into the Dark Realm, because in stealing his family's money, he was no longer pretending to be a criminal, he had just become one. The Sinclair of Limbus Company suffers in a very different way, as once inside the basement, Cromer leads Sinclair down a very long ventilation shaft, which descends into one of Elcorp's facilities, and more importantly, an abnormality containment chamber. One which stored an incredibly dangerous figure. Sinclair witnessed a horror that night unlike any he had before, and from that moment forward would be permanently altered as a person. Now, what they saw in the basement vents that night is slightly up for debate, but based on the evidence that I'll discuss more in depth later in the video, I believe this was the containment chamber for the aberration or subspecies of the abnormality known as Nothing's There, with its name likely being Everything's There. We also know that its form completely mesmerized Cromer, as she stared at this being who demonstrated not only the endless possibilities of the flesh, but also had a deep desire to be human itself, something that she could respect, a creature that she would consider 
deeply precious to her, and that Sinclair had become her hero for showing it to her. Afterwards, when Sinclair would ask for his key back from Cromer, she would not only give him it, but also two coins as well. These coins are of course a reference to the two marks that Franz would have gotten if he turned Sinclair in, and acting as his two chances to join Cromer in her mission, reinforced by the fact that eventually she ends up taking one of the coins away to ensure that Sinclair would never be able to live in comfort again. Working well with the theme of the imaginary debt and the consequences of working with Franz from the novel, though a great deviation from their inspiration comes on Christmas Eve, with Sinclair returning home to discuss with his parents what had happened between him and Cromer, much like how the Sinclair of the novel does, but instead he stumbles into a bloodbath. Cromer, alongside her Grosshammer Guido, had snuck into his home and eradicated Sinclair's family. I should mention that the presence of Guido here, as well as how Cromer commands him around, is what suggests that she has already ascended to the one who grips status, within Encorp's Inquisition. Now, the death of Sinclair's family of course ties back thematically to both the emotional distress that Franz caused Sinclair within the events of the novel, and how Book Sinclair felt like an empty stranger within his own home after becoming Franz's pet, but also also in the aforementioned nightmare that Book Sinclair had about killing his own father and making it a reality. Though Cromer would not harm Sinclair, instead she speaks to him in the same soft, understanding way that she had before, and then she reaches into his pocket and takes back one of her coins, all while telling him that one day she would call for him again, and if he were to come, she would take his second coin, and he'd be truly hers fully. Now, the reason for her obsession with Sinclair is a bit complicated, as in one of their future encounters, she describes seeing him in a parallel world, likely using the Encorp glass window singularity to do so, and what she saw was her perfect partner, someone who also possesses the power to grip, and together they would dominate the whole of the city, though it is possible that she was only able to catch a glimpse of a possible future following the events of the Christmas Eve massacre, as this had proved her worth to Encorp, but it's just as likely that she had known all this time who Sinclair could be and had been manipulating Sinclair purposefully. Either way, Cromer still considered Sinclair to be important to her simply because they shared values, and that he had proved himself as special to her that night by showing her abnormalities. He had become the key to her future, thus she saw fit to spare him from that slaughter, and following this event, she wouldn't see him again for quite a while. And within that time, Cromer would continue her crusade, eventually converting the Elcorp facility underneath Sinclair's home into her own personal torture chamber. It is here that she would become more and more enamored with pushing the human form to its absolute limit, and viewed the abnormalities as well as the ego pieces left over with wonderment. And in this facility, there seemed to be about three abnormalities stationed there. Firstly, the aforementioned aberration, everything's there. And then we have two unnamed abnormalities, one with a serpent-like theme to it, while the other is a blood-red beast, with the designs of these abnormalities actually reminding me a good bit of Bloodborne enemies, with the slithering and wiggling inquisitors resembling that of the snake balls of the Forbidden Woods as well as the snake-infected men, which works in line with Kalf's own forested location. As well, the crawling and four-legged inquisitors remind me more of a blood-red scourge beast, though the effect on their fur looks a bit closer to a blood fiend's transformation or one of their spawns. Now, how these Inquisitor abnormalities were created actually ties back to the true purpose of the torture chamber, as while it was partially used to punish heretics, Cromer began to subject her loyal followers to her own twisted experiments, as these volunteers would don ego uniforms and weapons, and then undergo physical and mental torture in order to purposefully induce ego corrosion, where the ego of an abnormality begins to devour the essence of the person, causing them to become abnormalities in their own right. This process is actually very similar to one of the things Young discussed when creating a persona, as those without a proper ego that can't control their mask will eventually be consumed by it, 
becoming fragile and lesser as people. As well, it is within this time that Cromer would begin to receive orders from Encorp to lay waste to the remainder of Kalf, beginning her full-scale invasion of the town. And to celebrate, Cromer would have Sinclair's family dug up and used to decorate Kalf like Christmas ornaments. This was done to recapture the feeling of her Christmas Eve slaughter, but now on a town-wide scale. Eventually, fully donning her The One Who Grips uniform, which I mentioned earlier, but now I can go into more detail about it. But before that, I should discuss her title as a whole, this being The One Who Grips, as it carries with it an importance to it that is also still rather awkwardly worded. This is because the title itself is a sort of strange reference, but makes sense in the long term, or should I say, a series of strange references. Firstly, like a lot of the character's influence, it's a callback to her own literary reference, this being Franz Cromer, whose first personal interaction with Emile Sinclair involved tightly gripping his arm and pulling him aside, showing not only how easily Franz can overpower Sinclair, but creating a metaphorical connection between the physical and psychological grip Franz had on Sinclair's life. Though the title also has direct ties to a German term and please mind my German pronunciation, Ergriffenheit and Ergreife, with Ergreife essentially meaning the one who seizes or grasps, and was popularized by the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung in his essay titled Wotan, or Odin. And this essay was a discussion of the changes in German society that Jung had noticed around 1936, and in it, Jung refers to Wotan and Ergreife as a psychic power of sorts built off the culture's repression from their true selves using the god Wotan, or Odin, as an example for Germany. Which is a concept that does thematically coincide with Cromer's own obsession with the purity of the human form, because as Jung believes, the Wotan is someone who is created in the shape of a nation's repressed desire or history, meaning that, symbolically, Cromer's character is created in response to Encorp's own brainwashing singularity, which causes a psychological repression of people's emotions, replacing their original ideas with one of a new culture, and thus, the one who grips, or the Ergreife, can eventually seize control of the populace and lead the masses without much effort. Her innate dislike of Encorp's heretics made her the perfect subject to become the next one who grips, or the Wotan of their group. As well, the writing of Jung has had a great influence on Sinclair and Cromer's characters as a whole, with Hess even describing his novel of Damien as a story about Jungian individuation. As well, while Hess's novel does predate Jung's Wotan essay, the value of personal identity and finding one's true self runs deep within the veins of both works, as well as Cromer's character as a whole. Now, the elements of Cromer's Inquisitor design that I hadn't mentioned fully before this was the prominence of gold in it. Firstly, we have these streaks of gold within her hair that she has had since she was a child. These gold streaks are likely not natural and are caused by some sort of ascension process to the one who grips his status. As we see in Encorp's Faust's ID that demonstrates the same gold streaks, albeit in a more chaotic fashion, while other Faust IDs that reference characters don't have her hair changed to match them. But Cromer also discusses things such as a golden ceremony within the events of the game, so it is fair to assume that it is part of the process. And it is also likely why gold plays such a major role in her character design, as gold and golden material is often a color associated with divinity in and of itself. From Catholicism and their gold-lined clothes and robes that demonstrated both purity and closeness with God, to the golden or gold-colored shrines from Eastern religions, which their creation dedicated a lot of spiritual significance to the God that was worshipped at said shrine, due to the rareness and perceived importance of that material. And of course, sticking to thematic consistency with her Germanic origins, the old Norse Germanic gods were said to have lived in a literal golden age, with everything from the massive structures made for giants to the simplest of tools and board games were all made of gold. It is a material that is divinely favored, and this aspect is clearly intended and felt throughout Cromer's entire design. Thus is why I believe her golden hair is linked with her perceived divinity, due to her being the one who grips, which again, ties back to Wotan. And continuing the discussion of her design, we also see a few golden accessories amongst her outfit, such as a long golden belt and a set of large golden stars adorned across her uniform. These, of course, are likely more than decorations, and they have their own seeming connection to 
her literary origins. As within Hess's novel, stars are often used to symbolize both an impossible goal and a far-off memory, with Cromer herself being connected greatly to both of these concepts. As just in being heard by Sinclair, she reawakens his traumatic memories, resulting in a breakdown that is similar to the one that occurs within the actual novel, when Sinclair sees the face of a woman within his dreams that reminds him of his traumatic youth, equating it to like seeing a star. Which, speaking of that, we also have Cromer's physical appearance as a whole, and I believe that she was designed in a way to tie back to another major character from said novel, this being Fra Eve, the mother of Max Damien, and someone who possesses the same power of control over the world known within the work as the Mark of Cain. She is also literally the woman of Sinclair's dreams, and one of the only times that he truly resonates with the world is when he attempts to make her fall for him, though the result of this seems to bring forth the dawn of World War One. Now, that power I just mentioned that Sinclair in the novel uses can actually tie back to the title of The One Who Grips, or more specifically, the sinner ID of The One Who Shall Grip, Sinclair, as Damien Sinclair and Eve all demonstrate a gift known as the Mark of Cain. This mark is something which can only be seen by those who have it and provides them with a great deal of understanding and influence over the world. Damien even uses his mark within the story to casually manipulate people with simple hand gestures. It is an immensely powerful ability and translates into the game itself rather well, being what makes the one who shall grip Sinclair so much more powerful than the Sinclair that we know, as the mark's gift will eventually allow him the strength to, in both alternate timelines, that being Cromer and Faust, usher in a city-wide rampage against heretics, seemingly done in reference to how the Mark of Cain's usage ushered in World War One. Also, side note, since the Mark of Cain has been mentioned, the one in Limbus Company has a heavy design inspiration from a similar mark with a similar idea from the American horror television series Supernatural. And the similarities don't just end at their visual appearance, but having a similar effect, gifting the person with phenomenal power in exchange for corrupting their soul, with Dean slowly becoming a demon the same way that Sinclair loses sanity every time he uses one of the coins under this ID. Though the one in the book is a lot less sinister, at least as far as I understood it, it is still connected with a supernatural entity. Now, returning to Cromer's appearance, she greatly matches up with descriptors used to create an image of Eva in the novel, as Sinclair describes Eva as a tall, almost masculine figure that looks like her son but with maternal traits, with unrivaled severity, deep passion, and beautifully alluring, almost an unapproachable person. As well, he explains her existence is some sort of miracle in and of itself, which a good number of these descriptors work very well thematically with elements of Cromer's own character. As of course you have her physical appearance, but in a more emotional sense as well, as Cromer is the first person that Sinclair has met who understands his distaste for prosthetics, sharing his pride for the natural human form. She also uses her charm to try to earn his trust initially, with Sinclair even calling her his first friend. Now, the way the two of them bond is actually rather similar to how Sinclair bonds with Eve and Damien within the novel, as while Cromer doesn't share the Mark of Cain that Damien and Sinclair and Eve have, she does share Sinclair's views on transhumanism versus transcendence, as Hess's novel ties not only together with Carl Jung's own writing, but also that of Gnosticism as well, and more specifically, the Canaanites, which, to briefly summarize, is a sect that views humanity as split into two specific classes the spiritual and material, with the material beings focusing on a world ruled by the Demiurge creator who essentially dooms those who worship it to destruction. They are often depicted as those who desperately cling on to their physical life and physical form, as well as those who revel in the physical goods of the Demiurge's world, which has been modernized in Limbus to those with mechanical prosthetics, enhancements, and other transhumanist modifications, while those of a spiritual nature often view their bodies as similar to flesh prisons, which they will eventually ascend from, being able to triumph over material beings with relative ease the same way that Cain triumphed over Abel, which 
which has also been modernized in Limbus and all of Project Moon setting as Transcendence, a spiritual awakening which allows those who have awakened to inflict their own judgment on the material world. This can be seen in the form of abnormalities, ego, and of course, arguably distortions. Cromer, and in some ways Sinclair, fall very deeply into the spiritual view. From her traditional religious attire and outdated metal arms triumphing over the more technologically advanced materialistic robots of K-Corp, to her even considering the very act of using a prosthetic to avoid one's pain or suffering as a filthy act of cowardice, and even viewing the remnants of human emotions in the shells of robot bodies as simple programming that is eerily similar to human, but strictly not. And this is why when Sinclair shows her the abnormalities underneath her home, does she gain the key that she had been looking for, the proof in her Canaanite-like belief, the power of the human spirit given form. Now can you imagine if she was able to figure out how to manifest her own ego? Also, tying back to the novel, within it, Eva, Damien, and Sinclair all also fall into the spiritualistic category, rejecting elements of the modern world to develop themselves in a spiritual way and being rewarded with the mark of Cain's abilities, freely manipulating the material world like it was nothing. As well, returning to the story of Limbus, when Sinclair attempts to resonate with the Golden Bow, the same way that Emile Sinclair tried to influence the world using his Mark of Cain, this causes the Dungeon of Canto 3 to take its true form. Though, unfortunately, he was much too late to actually claiming control over the Bow, as the Dungeon does not end up becoming fully influenced by Sinclair, but instead it is shaped by Cromer, who had been experimenting with it thanks to her time spent testing the remains of the Ego residue left within the old Elcorp facility, reveling in the true beauty of humanity. Though, it is still implied that Sinclair does resonate with the bow, as we are given glimpses into his memory specifically, but it is also his fear and hatred towards Cromer that allows her to fully manifest the end of the dungeon herself, resulting in a massive spiraling mountain of corpses, surrounded on all ends by her loyal subjects worshipping her and in preparation for her own transcendence. Though, after the sinners reach the peak of the mountain, they are finally able to challenge Cromer herself. And this battle sees Cromer stand against the sinners all by herself, starting with the first phase of her boss fight and the accompanying rendition of her boss theme this being Between Two Worlds by Project Melee, which is a song comprised of two segments. We'll be discussing The Light Realm, which is a slow, almost church-like choir song with lyrics that act as sort of a duet conversation between Cromer and Sinclair, referring to their past, from the Christmas Eve that would change the trajectory of both of their lives forever, to Cromer referring to Sinclair as her hero. One lyric in particular that sticks out to me is, why does the common flame hold so much power? which can be read from both perspectives. The common flame or fire in this scenario is Sinclair. He is the spark that ignites the flame which burned his whole town down. A spark which came from a boy who considered himself to be so boring and mundane that he needed to share classified information about his own family to get anyone to notice him. As well, the common flame holding great power may also refer to Sinclair's own Mark of Cain, as not only does the Encorp ID have a burn stack element element to it, the mark itself is imperceivable by a common person. People like Cromer, who, because they lack the mark, are seemingly not able to understand what actually made Sinclair special. Instead, what she found fascinating about him was their shared disdain for prosthetics and a vision that she saw from another world. As well, the two-world nature of the song also reflects the novel Sinclair's belief of the two worlds, a dual nature that is seen all throughout the sinner's own design. Even being able to capture the understanding of the Light Realm in the closing lyrics of this section, longing to live in a naively pure, painless, and forgiving world. A world of comfort that Sinclair tossed away when engaging with Cromer. As well, Cromer thematically links up with two specific sins within the game of Limbus. Firstly, you have Pride, as she takes great pride in her own purity, being likely what inspired her path in life as a whole. As well, she has a particularly strong tie to the sin of lust as well, both in her obsession with the experiencing of pain and the experimenting in the realms of the flesh. Along with this, Sinclair describes the lust bond abnormality, the pectatolum luxore, 
claiming that their expressions reminded him of Cromer. And we even see her relations to these sins in her deck of coins throughout the fight. In her first phase, she uses primarily pride coins. As well, this first phase has a special gimmick to it if you are able to bring N. Sinclair to the fight, as Cromer will start the fight auto-staggered, completely distracted by the existence of her Sinclair, even having special dialogue that plays into it. Though, after reducing Cromer's HP to 1, the fight then transitions to her second phase, and she fully resonates with the Golden Bough's power, causing her body to change to match her true sin, becoming an abnormality, Cromer, the dreamer of human wholeness. And with this second phase also comes a dissection of the second portion of Between Two Worlds, the Realm of Darkness. The tone of this theme is noticeably more chaotic, with the piano's rising crescendo increasing the tension of the song as the difficulty of the fight itself increases. Along with this, the lyrics continue to convey the conversation between Sinclair and Cromer, which while of course is packed full of references to their inspiration, also focuses on the sin of lust as a whole. Some specific words used in it even suggest that Sinclair has created Cromer, referring to herself as infected and being recreated by Sinclair's influence, which matches up very well with her new design. And speaking of that new form, it is essentially the perfect climax to all the ideas that we have been discussing about her character so far. Starting first with how Damien describes her. Cromer was trying to ascend to godhood in this moment, becoming like the old gods that humans had worshipped in the past, which is essentially a direct literal interpretation of Carl Jung's Wotan essay. Cromer is trying to become a god in living form. As well, Cromer's arms and body resemble portions of the abnormality that she witnessed that day. Likely, everything's there. And it is this being that has infected her with lustful desires to contort the human form to its absolute limit. This was a twisted mentality that eventually resulted in her own desire to give birth to a new world in her image. In fact, there's a lot of birthing imagery and symbolism tied to her character at this moment. Firstly, you have the nearly Silent Hill-esque vaginal appearance of her lower half, mixing together with her connection between torture and physical pain as it allows people to ascend into a greater form, which is symbolized by her lower mouth having elements of an Iron Maiden. We also see four massive grasping arms erupting from the hole, all which intend to grab and pull anything within her, which feels like an intentional callback to the door which Dante sees whenever he needs to revive a sinner, the final safety net for Sinclair retooled into total grotesquerie. Cromer, of course, also has her own maternal influence in the form of Eva from the novel, whose name even ties Cromer to the biblical Eve as well, this link being reinforced by the lyrics, a fruit, a sin, a holy mother, amongst the list of things that twisted Cromer's desire into what she is now, and again ties back to the themes of rebirth through physical pain, as in some readings, Eve consuming the forbidden fruit of knowledge is what led to the great increase in labor pains that comes with actually giving birth. Earth. This doesn't just stop here, either, as keeping in line with the biblical elements of her character so far, the other two abnormalities that she experimented with are a beast and a snake, both having associations with demons and the devil, specifically the snake being the one that tempted Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. As well, the lyrics of the Dark Realm portion also speak of someone hatching from an egg and becoming a new form, which not only helps paint the body of Cromer's monstrous half into a more horrific, unfinished being, with the popping veins of it resembling the freshly grown internal workings of an embryo, but also giving off the impression that she had hatched too early. As well, other elements of her design do remind me of the more organic monster wings found on Seraph Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, another character who was empowered through the thoughts and fears of the protagonist, though I am unsure if this is anything more than simply a coincidence. Though the novel in which she takes most of her inspiration from also has another specific bird that is likely her biggest influence here, as the older novel Sinclair got, the more he learned about Abraxas, a Gnostic deity-like figure who took on qualities of a massive bird-like man with snakes for legs. Sinclair often would imagine an egg of sorts which Abraxas was trying to hatch from. Abraxas was also worshipped 
as a supreme ruler over all creation, and empowers those who live within both the Dark and Light Realm. And Abraxas' own egg symbolism is found in the Sinner's own logo, but also relates to my statements about Cromer's own design having a stained yellow color palette that resembles that of an egg, as she herself was intended to hatch near the end of Canto 3 into this horrific bird-like being. As well, slightly returning to her Encorp uniform, the wax-like red stamps adorned to her uniform and the uniform of the Inquisitors may also be in reference to the charms and amulets of Abraxas' worship, as they are believed to have magical qualities and can bring good fortune to those who wear them. Abraxas even wraps back around to reinforcing the Eva, Eve, and Cromer connection, as creation and birth are themes that are greatly tied together. As well, Abraxas' look within the book is also tied to the coat of arms of Sinclair's family, with his bird head being golden yellow, which in turn reinforces the divine nature of Cromer's own golden hair, almost cementing that she would become the embodiment of Sinclair's Abraxas. And then, mixing this ascension together with Cromer's own lustful obsession, you begin to see and understand her character fully. She has perverted the human form in more ways than one all the while retaining every element of her humanity. Her experimenting within the realms of the body and the nature of pain itself is only rivaled by that of the Xenobites from the Hellraiser franchise. We also see that the lust element of her character can be represented in her own deck of coins, transforming all the prideful sins she once had for her cult and old way of life into a lustful expression of her true nature. Though, within the novel, Abraxas is used mostly in a symbolic way, mainly to cement Sinclair's own development as a person, and it is through hatching does Sinclair learn more about himself, which is then translated to Limbus's own Sinclair projecting their feelings towards Cromer. This in turn helps her transform into the being shaped in the form of Abraxas, which is why he could never overcome her in her current state, and the more he struggled against her, the more powerful he made her. She had retained the control from all those years ago, even being shown in the ending lyrics of the Darkness Realm portion of her boss theme. This being control, 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 release, which summarizes Cromer's own relation, each control being a moment in which Cromer manipulated Sinclair from her befriending him to asking for his key and then giving him the coins, only to release her grip from him for a moment. Following this, you have control, betray, control, let go, which breaks down their last encounter, where Cromer controls the scene, betrays Sinclair's trust by killing his family, took a coin from him and therefore regaining control of his life, and then letting him go out into the wild. And then finally, we have Conceal, Reveal, Unreal, Surreal, all in reference to her return, concealing herself at first, then making her return in a big reveal, devastating their home in an unreal way, and then the surreal environment of the dungeon. Cromer's grasp on Sinclair is something that he cannot fight, and it is only when Damien descends on from high like the godlike figure the book makes him out to be, it's Cromer able to be smited with a single swipe of his hand. An action which mirrors Damien saving Sinclair from Cromer's bullying in the novel. Which brings us to the closing act on Cromer, as ultimately her fate of being snubbed out at the last possible second before achieving her goal by a being she couldn't possibly fathom is honestly a perfect summary of her own character. Because while she is presented in the canto as this powerful, free-thinking schemer with a tight grip on the cultural psyche of the world, in reality, almost everything about her was manufactured. Tools she was given by someone else and possessing gifts which could have been put to better uses failing almost entirely because she couldn't see the actual true strength of humanity before her, blinded instead by her own sins. In a way, her character is ironically just as manufactured as the robots she vehemently hated. And while I believe that Cromer's story has reached its natural conclusion, Canto 3 has wiped the slate clean for Sinclair's story to truly begin, and because of this, I doubt this will be the last time we hear or maybe even see her again. As hearkening back to the novel one final time, Sinclair Claire's encounter with Franz Cromer is one of the most defining moments of his life. This encounter changes him forever, so much so that one of the last things that Damien mentions to him in their adulthood is asking, do you remember Franz Cromer? And with that all said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. Cromer is one of those characters that just really sticks with you in Limbus's story. From her overwhelming presence, to wonderfully dense character themes, to a tone-setting environment, even a spectacular performance by Yu eun so who blends perfectly together this manic, cutesy performance that really makes a lot of Cromer's lines land. Oh yeah, 
싱클레어가 돌아왔어? 날 보러 와 싱클레어 난 네가 알던 그곳에 있어 잘봐 내가 조명을 켜줄 테니까 눈 크게 뜨고 짜잔 Cromer is the perfect mood setter for Limbus, which has been helped slightly by the fact that the IDs associated with her and her story are still top tier two cantos past her death. And given the importance of Christmas time in the story, I felt it was only right to release a video featuring her around this time. Though I'll still say, Cromer is a densely packed character, and there was a lot to unpack with her both symbolically and also just within Limbus's story, as Limbus is a little confusing timeline-wise, and I'm not entirely sure where certain events take place, so if I got something wrong in that regard, I do apologize. Feel free to correct me below in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. Every little bit helps keep the channel flowing as smoothly as it does. And if if you want to ascend in your own right, well, you can do so by buying a copy of Shimonetta, a boring world with a constant dirty jokes doesn't exist at buyshimonetta.com.